I am Heidi Benjaminson, your host of Confidence Coaching, a podcast for mothers of teenagers who want to feel less worry and more hope. Life isn't a spectator sport. Success comes to those who show up every day with a pocket full of courage, grit, and a little sparkle. I'm glad you're here. Hello, hello, friends. This is episode 125, the anchoring tool, responding versus reacting. I'm so glad you're here. Make sure you hit subscribe so you get new episodes each Wednesday. And just so you know, for many episodes, I am now uploading a short video on YouTube where I give you extra examples into the topic of the podcast for all of you visual learners like me. So find my YouTube channel. It's my name. Hit subscribe there. You can actually listen to the audio of each episode there and then see the short video. They're only like five minutes or so. Now, I also email out a link to my email list. If you're not on it, you need to get on it. Sign up at HeidiBenjaminson.com. Today, I want to walk you through a tool I use with clients to help with confidently responding to a person or a situation and not emotionally reacting. We all know the feeling of being angry or saying something that we regret because of a knee-jerk reaction, feeling out of control emotionally, and reacting with little thought of what we're saying or doing. There is a real difference when we respond to a situation or when we react to a situation, respond to a person or react to a person. Reacting feels automatic and out of control, just like when our knee reflexes are checked by the doctor and his hammer. Our lower leg gives no thought to kicking back out. Reacting is operating from our lower survival-based brain, the amygdala, Reacting will always be us protecting ourselves, protecting what we love. Maybe it's our children. Reacting is usually full of heightened emotions. Now, let's just say reacting and having cortisol and adrenaline coursing through our bodies is very useful when we actually need to be angry or running for our lives or fighting. In some cases, reacting does protect us. So we want these parts of our brains to always be there. Reacting feels like we're acting with no thought. It's usually unconscious words and actions that we're then taking. A few years ago, my daughter and I witnessed a bad car accident. We pulled over, we called 911, we helped the driver and their children out of the car. I handed my phone to my daughter who, she was probably only 10 or 11 at the time for her to finish telling 911 where we were so I could help get the children out of the car. We were reacting in this situation. These are helpful reactions. Now, less helpful reactions are when I text my kids when I'm angry with something that they've done or didn't do, or when I'm making some assumptions. I've yelled and slammed doors, which again are usually unhelpful reactions. We all have our favorite go-to reactions that express to the world that we're not happy. Of course, we can have super positive reactions but these usually don't create future problems for us. Responding, on the other hand, is more intentional. When we respond to someone, we use our higher brain and we aren't in survival, default, unconscious mode. Responding includes thinking about what we're saying or doing. How do we want to say it? Maybe responding is us staying silent or deciding that we don't want to address an issue. I'll talk about that in a moment. Responding comes from our higher brain, our confident and human prefrontal cortex that can assess how another person may feel, that can project how our words and actions may be interpreted and may impact someone else or the future. One thing I like about texting and email communication that's so common in this century is that we have the opportunity, now everyone doesn't take it, but we have the opportunity to write our thoughts and maybe save them in draft then rewrite them or have someone review what we're saying, how we're communicating and give input, or help us be sure to communicate what we want. Often we can even react in writing, save it to draft, and then delete it because we realize we don't want to respond. Now, of course, electronic communications can be tricky because we can't read body language or tone, so it isn't perfect. But we've all had to maybe write a sensitive note 
and we take time to make sure the words reflect our sincere meaning. This is responding. Often the difference between the two is that when we react, we do so with defensiveness and assumptions. We're rarely taking responsibility for our emotions in this state. Yesterday, there was a knock on my door and I thought it was a salesperson and I just felt all those emotions rise in me as if I wasn't in control. My reaction would have been pure irritation and blaming this other person for me coming to the door. But it's my choice to answer the door or not. It's my choice how I talk to this person. My response is my choice. On my walk to the door, I dropped my assumptions, which was good because it was a flower delivery. Now, I want to go through several examples of how to feel the reactions in our body and how to anchor ourselves into our higher confident brain so we like how we respond, how our responses are a reflection of the self that we want to be. In today's connected world, we have access and schools ensure that we can see our children's grades, homework, and so on. We have to really anchor ourselves emotionally if we're going to monitor and check in on these data points. For years, I reacted and was a bundle of frustration and anger. Reaction included a lot of closed-minded assumptions, no curiosity. I didn't question the validity of the grades or marks in the system. Reactions assumed the worst in the school and the teachers, my children, which makes sense because our lower brain will always scan for the negative. So on default, I let the negative drive the relationship, which was very unproductive. These reactions always put my children on the defensive and projected to my kids that we were not on the same team. My reactions were like that privacy window in a limousine. They created disconnection. So I learned to anchor myself, which looks like this. I prepared myself and was very intentional on what I said to myself when I would look at grades. I'd remind myself that teachers don't input things on time. I'd remind myself this doesn't reflect all of the work or effort. And I want to be someone who focuses on effort, not outcome. I'd remind myself these did not reflect any future potential or success. Now, I'm totally making my kids out to have bad grades. We're a house maybe with varying grades, I'll say. Those systems are designed to only show a snapshot that can cause our blood to boil. I have to say, I don't check those systems anymore. Not ever. I've disengaged from them. My kids manage their work well. They bring their grades to me and we focus huge amounts of attention on whatever they want to show me and discuss about their grades. Now, if you're more engaged than me, get your head in the place of remembering that there is so much that's not reflected there. Get curious. The best tool you have is to ask questions and practice asking questions with curiosity, not defensiveness. There's a difference between saying, why aren't you turning in your math homework? What's wrong? And saying, I see your teacher hasn't marked your homework turned in. What do you think the delay is about this? In this case, also responding, maybe staying silent. Responding doesn't have to mean action. We can intentionally choose to not let it be a problem. Usually, we need to create a space, a pause to get our higher brain online. If you can remove yourself to take a breath and get this pause, do it. Breathing until you're in control is one of the best ways to move from reacting to responding. I had memories of reacting in highly emotional and attacking ways when finding things of my kids that my lower brain was very angry to see, things that made me think that things had really gone wrong with my kids. If I yelled and projected my assumptions, my kids' defenses went right up. I usually had done little questioning and processing and was angry. Y'all, we can see the disconnection in our kids' faces that this creates. Luckily for me, And I say that sarcastically, my kids still give me opportunities to now practice responding in a way that helps me feel safe and know I'm concerned and also love them and respect that I don't have all the facts. I get myself together by asking, what do I know about the situation and what do I not know about the situation? I have to make my brain set aside the worries and assumptions that it creates like a spiral. I have to ask, Is this a big deal or not? Do I need to discuss this with my child? If I do, I ask, who do I want to be? 
Can I be someone with love and hope? Which also may mean giving punishments or having a lot more structure. Or do I want to react emotionally and create distance with my children? Which, of course, I don't want to do. I find questions are usually one of the best ways to respond if I need to get more information. I say, tell me what I'm not seeing about this. There were several out of the ordinary charges on my credit card for my son's college. And at first I got mad, had lots of assumptions, and my lower brain thought getting mad at him or at his school would be helpful. I calmed myself and when I discussed it with him, he explained what he thought had happened with the apartment rent. We also realized a big problem the college had made with tuition. These solutions or the sources of the problems were not what I was looking for when I was in reaction mode. But because I calmed down and I got to curiosity and also reminded myself that someone else knows more than me, I asked questions and I didn't put my son on the defensive. We stayed on the same team. Now, another question to ask someone when we want to respond with curiosity is, help me understand why you're doing or did or said this. We're gathering more information. When your neighbor puts up a fence without asking you, get information before responding. And it's the same with emotional fences. When I feel the need to respond to an issue, I ask myself, what would love do in this situation? Love for me and love for all of the people in the story. I remember being hurt by a friend's text and some assumptions that she had made, and she lashed out at me. I wanted to react by hurting back, which was me being defensive. Luckily, I caught myself, and I had some time to think. I asked myself, can I respond in a way that breaks this cycle of being defensive and wanting to lash out? What part of this problem can I own that I'm responsible for? I had to take a bit of time for myself, and I didn't respond until I was in a place of love for everyone. I asked myself, who do I want to be in this situation? I want to be someone who's humble. And also I want to respond in a way that shows I'm willing to handle the discomfort of a conversation where we might not agree. As much as I think staying silent can be a good response at times, there are times when responding with confidence that uncomfortable feelings are okay is the most emotionally mature and confident way to handle a situation. When we do want to respond, always start sentences with I. So say, I am feeling disappointed with this or that. Don't project what you think the other person did or is feeling. Stay with I am feeling and wanting this. I have these questions. I want to hear your thoughts on this. If you start statements with I, there is a higher chance of staying anchored in your lane. Remember that responding can also be admitting fault and letting other people be right. Our lower brain wants us to be right. So we'll react with limited information to defend our sometimes, quote, not right positions. Our higher brain has to remind ourselves it's okay to respond by admitting we don't know everything, that there is space for us to learn. A few years ago, I posted something on Facebook regarding a life coaching tool, and another life coach, who I don't personally know, sent me a direct message telling me that there was an error in my post. I felt the defensiveness rise up in me. I wanted to react by asking her, why in the world is she trolling Facebook to correct people? I actually thought, and I still think that what I put on there was accurate, but After managing my reactionary thoughts and emotions, I decided to just send her a simple response that said, you may be right. That's it. Simple. No defensiveness. No attacking in response. Maybe she is right. Maybe not. Who cares? I made my response end the discussion in a kind and humble way. There are other times I definitely need to say I'm sorry and I'm wrong. I feel so much better when I do that and respond allowing others to be right, or at least allowing that I don't know everything. It's taken me decades to get to this place, and it feels so much better. I've mentioned several times that there is a place to respond with silence. I'm amazed at how many people feel such intense need to react to social media posts with their heated and divisive opinions. Y'all, just keep scrolling. If you're going to respond, do so with respect for everyone. If you can't do this, 
get off social media. I know I stay away from people who trigger me. I want to be in control of my reactions. There's nothing wrong with leaving a virtual or physical situation where we don't feel in control of our reactions and responses anymore. This can be a very loving thing to do and prevents us from creating disconnection and hurt in the world, in our relationships. Okay, so to wrap up, only respond when you're doing so with intention and ask lots of questions. Respond with sentences that start with I. Respond knowing who you want to be in the engagement. Own every part of the response. Blaming is reacting. Being responsible for our words is responding. And there are situations when we just don't need to respond or engage. Okay, that's it for this week. If you would like personalized weekly private one-on-one coaching to learn to respond instead of reacting to your family, sign up for a consult call at HeidiBenjaminson.com. I currently have one opening. A confident mother is the greatest gift to her family, not a perfect mother. Our families want us to feel confident, anchored, and calm. I can help you uncover this version of yourself. Have a great week.